Santé and I'm working uh, at both General Electric Healthcare and the uh, MAP5 Laboratory under the supervision of Joan Glones. I'm working on the automatic annotation of vascular trees using um, atlas based registration. Uh, so we know the labels of the atlas and uh, with the large deformations diffeomorphic metric mapping, we are registering a source onto a target, and then we transfer the labels. Though, in most of the cases, the atlas is way simpler than the target, and the classic metrics that, we, that one can use uh, in such a framework are not working. So, to give you a first idea, we wanted to include our template that is simpler into our target and uh, transfer uh, the, the labels uh, that way. Can, can you uh, change the slide? All right, so we, in this work with Irene Kaltenmark, we introduced, uh, sorry, Marianne, an asymmetric dissimilarity term. And uh, so uh, there are still uh, some, uh, some problems uh, with this property, but uh, it allows us to include this uh, deformed source into the target. As you can see on the left, there are a lot of problems with the classic variable distance. And with uh, this uh, dissimilarity term, uh, we are able to, to include our uh, simplified atlas. So feel free to discuss uh, this with me anytime during the conference or after. Thanks. So good afternoon, everyone. Oh, sorry. Oh, we forgot the mask. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Andrea Bellotto da Silva. So I'm going to present to you a little bit of uh, the project, uh, a general system of differential equations to model first order adaptive algorithms. So how do I change the, oh, changing the slide. Thanks. So it's a, it's a project about optimization in deep learning. So um, optimization in deep learning no normally has it demands to train a multi-layer neural networks, and this can be very costly. So in 2014, uh, Ba introduced a new algorithm to, of optimization called uh, ADAM, that they call ADAM, and they show that uh, it outperforms SGD, at least in uh, certain situations. And our goal was to try to study a little bit of ADAM itself, so to, to understand uh, why it converges and why does it work well in deep, uh, in deep learning. So can we change this? Thanks. So in a project with Maxime Gazot, we, we tried our initial goal, our intended goal was to first help the practitioner to choose the initial conditions of the learning rate and the hyperparameters and to pro provide some qualitative advice on when to use Adam instead of SGD. Uh, for that, we, we established ourselves some, some goals. So our first step was to, to try to, to build a differential theory, so to approach the, the, the algorithm via differential equation. So provide a differential equation and then study its convergence. And second, try to infer from it uh, some practical advices, so to find some appropriate intervals where to choose the hyperparameters, and uh, give a qualitative situations where Adam converges or does not converge. And we were, we partially and provide advice to improve the algorithm too, in between the class of adaptive uh, algorithms. And we made some progress in uh, in these directions. And the poster is going to present the progress that we made uh, in this in the paper with with Maxime. So thanks a lot. So hello, I'm Cyril Cano. I'm a PhD student in Grenoble. My supervisors are Eric chasson motin and Nicolas Bion. So to start, uh, we'll start uh, with a little bit of context. So uh, gravitational waves are perturbations of space-time curvature. Uh, I particularly focused on one type of sources, which are binary of black holes, so couple of black holes. Uh, direct observation of, of uh, gravitational waves are now possible thanks to uh, detectors as uh, advanced Virgo and advanced LIGO. So gravitational waves are, are polarized, it, which means there is two orientation, orientations of deformation of space-time, plus and cross polarization. Uh, when a gravitational wave is passing through the Earth, each of these detectors will measure a linear combination of signals associated with each of these polarizations, H plus and H plus. And 
H plus and H cross are amplitude and frequency modulated signals, and their relations, uh, the relations of H plus and H cross, uh, is defined by uh, source properties, and this is what we want to characterize. So to do that, we have uh, a new mathematical tool, and you can. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's define a uh, complex signal H, a bivariate complex signal H, as H plus minus I H cross. You have an example of a simulated one for binary of black holes. Here you can see uh, the variation of the shape of the ellipse is due to variation of the orbital plane. So uh, we use a quaternionic embedding of H to describe the variation of the shape of the ellipse. We, asso we associate uh, H and it's H, the quaternionic embedding of H. This is like uh, the analytic signal associated with a real valued signal. So quaternions are a generalization of complex numbers in uh, four dimensions, uh, co complex numbers algebra in four dimensions. So thanks to this quaternionic embedding, we have access to four uh, features of our signals, A, theta, K, and phi, which describe the shape of the ellipse. Uh, thanks to this, thanks to this, uh, we can try to uh, reconstruct our gravitational wave signals with uh, polarization targeting priors, and we can also use uh, these uh, these uh, parameters as features to learn a generative model for gravitational waves, which is of great interest for saint for physicists. And that's all. <laughs> I want to. Say <laughs> I hope I will see you Wednesday. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm just going to tease you about a work that has been carried out but, uh, by Aaron Wu, who was uh, an intern at our lab uh, in Iriza in Iran. And he based his work on the code uh, produced by Axel Marmoret, who is now a PhD student uh, working with um, Nancy Bertin, Frédéric Bambo and myself. And so the research topic uh, is, uh, say, um, source separation for automatic music transcription. And the tool we use is uh, Comparative NMF. So transcription is the poem described on the left column, where you have uh, some audio file. Here is a very simple audio file with uh, a piano playing three notes, uh, G, F, and uh, B uh, sharp, uh, B flat, sorry. Um, what you do is you can, for instance, um, represent that uh, data of audio uh, in the time frequency matrix using the short time Fourier transform, and you obtain a non-negative matrix. Uh, and the problem is to extract from this data the individual notes and the rhythmic pattern. So to obtain the small music sheet on the bottom left. To do that, one possibility, um, which is maybe not state of the art anymore, but uh, it used to be uh, at least one of the top uh, methods is the non-negative matrix factorization. So you take this STFT matrix and you try to write it as a product of two matrices, W and H, which are non-negative. And um, morally, the W should represent the frequency template for nodes, like uh, sol C bemol, and uh, the H should be the time activations. Uh, and then you can post-process the H matrix and the W matrix, estimate the, fr the, um, the frequencies in W and uh, the activation in H, and you obtain a tentative uh, music sheet, basically. The problem is that NMF as itself is not uh, always unique. It's often non-unique. It means you can have several solutions. And so your W and H may not make sense. Okay? And you can see that as a generation of PCA that was presented this morning. So. Um, and so in the work I'm going to present in the poster, so it's a teaser, so I won't describe too much, but what we do is two things. First, we use uh, supervision. So we first train W on separated isolated nodes. And so for each node, for instance, uh, the C4, we can have one column in W, which is fixed. And then you only train W H, sorry, from the song. Um, but what we can also do is, um, which is at the bottom right corner, is say, okay, but one note should not be just one column, one frequency template. It's more, there's more information is in one note, and we can actually try to have a whole spectrogram for each single note and fit um, NMF with this extended um, W. 
and uh, at least to convertible NMF, and that's what we do. So if you're interested, you can come and see uh, hopefully the virtual poster on Wednesday. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I will present you uh, one uh, theoretical study uh, uh, for uh, large dimensional transfer learning with a potential application to radar images uh, pulsar. And uh, this uh, work has uh, two uh, objectives. One is to understand uh, theoretically uh, the mechanism of transfer learning in a uh, large dimensional setup, and also to uh, apply it for uh, uh, radar data that needs, uh, that are critical data that needs uh, the performance guarantees much more than uh, absolute performance that we can't explain. Thank you very much. So the tools we will use to uh, provide our theoretical approach comes come from a random matrix theory. And uh, thanks to this, we are, uh, we are able to have uh, asymptotical performance in double asymptotic, in double asymptotic and uh, we can uh, analyze, interpret the results we have in front of us and also uh, potentially improve them. And uh, to apply it, we will use a transfer learning mechanism. That is, uh, we don't do like in classical machine learning, as we evoked this morning, uh, separated uh, machine learning tasks for each problem. But we will, we will use eventual similarity between tasks in order to improve a target task. Uh, thank you very much. A uh, target task that has uh, insufficient uh, annotated data, as you know, uh, we face uh, failing supervised learning in this, conte in this context. Ah, pardon. Thank you. Uh, so we'll use similar uh, source data to improve uh, the classification, the supervised learning, and I will uh, explain later what is similar. And uh, third, thank you very much. Uh, we will merge uh, the learning set in order to improve uh, the performance. And uh, finally, uh, we will uh, be able to apply it to environmental uh, monitoring and uh, perform a label optimization, which is uh, uh, available since we have uh, asymptotic result on the, thank you very much, on the um, probability, uh, on the asymptotic probability of uh, classification. Oops. So um, to conclude, I will ch show you just uh, one particular result uh, we had. So if we take um, alpha, uh, the uh, parameter uh, on the abscess uh, that uh, will um, modelize uh, the resemblance between target and source data. So uh, one is for target and source similar and zero for target and source completely different. We see that uh, we are able uh, in a very uh, uh, hard scenario of negative transfer, that is uh, at the left, when you have a very poor classification performance with a naive uh, labels uh, minus one one applied to source and data, we have to adapt our labels uh, for and provide an optimal labelization that perform uh, much, uh, much better uh, in a transfer learning context. Thank you very much. I'm Marco Lazzaretti, a PhD student from the uh, University of Genova. I will present a weighted uh, cellulose sparse regularization for mo molecule localization in super resolution microscopy with uh, Poisson data. And it's a joint work with uh, Luca Calatroni and Claudio Satico. Um, to give you an idea of the background, um, in uh, in uh, the um, classical microscopy images, the uh, resolution of the images, images is uh, co um, corrupted by the light uh, diffraction phenomena. And to um, avoid it, uh, the idea uh, is to, instead of getting just one acquisition, as the one on the bottom line in the left, to get a sequence of acquisitions, like the one on the first row. Oh, okay, this should be a video, but uh, I mean, it's not a problem. And um, we uh, then reconstruct each uh, singular frame and then get uh, reconstructions and summing all the reconstruction up, we get a final reconstruction that should be um, forming on the, on the right. And so um, since we have to reconstruct uh, molecule intensity, we have to uh, enforce a sparsity and to do so we consider L0 um, uh, sparsity regularizer 
and uh, the, um, the presence of the Poisson noise is modeled by a signal dependent uh, L2 weighted um, fidelity term. And this, um, this functional is non continuous and non convex due to the presence of the L0 norm. And, to, um, and the um, optimization problem is NPR and uh, combinatorial. So it's quite uh, difficult to, um, to solve it uh, algorithmically. And to avoid these uh, drawbacks, we, um, we considered a non convex and continuous regularization, uh, relaxation of the L0 norm called the weighted zero penalty which is, um, which is uh, de mm, dependent on both the matrix A of the model and the observed data, as you can see in the plot. And um, depend, um, it reflects also the, um, the signal dependent uh, characteristics of the Poisson noise. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Seed, and I'm a PhD student from Grenoble. So uh, I will be at the poster session on Wednesday to talk about our work called Graph Signal Smoothing with Random Spanning Forests. Um, so on graphs, you can find numerous random processes, and some of them are interesting to analyze. In fact, random spanning forests are such examples. They have interesting probabilistic properties and even links with algebraic graph theory. And in this work, we uh, leverage these properties for uh, application of graph, signals, uh, graph signal processing. In particular, uh, we propose two known Monte Carlo estimators for the application of graph signal smoothing, in which you are given a graph and a noisy signal on its vertices. And the purpose is to obtain a smooth version of the given signal by using the underlying graph structure. So uh, if you are interested in my work or if you are just curious about this mysterious random process, uh, please uh, come and let's talk in any time. Thanks. Uh, my name is Willis Rodriguez and uh, my work, uh, the, the work I'm presenting in the poster is about uh, how to compute distances between documents. So uh, a common task when you do uh, NLP is to try to classify documents for uh, given a given criteria. Uh, and in order to do that, the first one of the first thing to do is to define a distance that makes sense. So uh, people have been trying a lot of things like TF, uh, IDF, uh, some basic stuff. Uh, and there's um, a, a very popular method called LDA. So it stands for uh, Latin Dirichlet Allocation. Uh, but uh, that method does not give you ex directly a distance. It gives you, so for, for my application, I'm going to use the, I, I'm going to interpret the output as just a couple of matrices, which are the matrices that I'm going to call beta and, and the matrices that I'm going to call theta, uh, which are basically topic representations. So uh, for, for the output, the topic representation is just a distribution uh, of words. So how likely uh, is a word to, be, uh, to appear in that topic? So spores, we're going to have some a different, uh, if I'm talking about spore, I'm going to use a different set of, work, of, of words as, uh, as if I'm talking about uh, science, for example. So uh, the question is, how do we uh, define a distance based on that? Um, and turns out that uh, makes sense to uh, ask the question of how uh, how similar those topics are, and after how similar the document the, the documents are going to be. But first, let's 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 stick with with the distance between topics. And and um, if I have if if I found a way of uh, of uh, a notion of distances between the words used in the document, in, in the topics, sorry, uh, maybe I can define the distance between, between topics. Uh, so next slide, please. So just to be uh, uh, quickly, uh, in the left, we have, you have a one representation of the document. In blue, there's, uh, there's one topic, and in red is a different topic. So for me, it's going to be just uh, distributions. So uh, histograms, to, uh, to, uh, to say, to call in, in, in some way, 
And, and what I'm representing in red, at the, in green at the left, is distances between the different words. And those distances can be computed using uh, a, no, um, a word embedding. I'm, I'm going to use a uh, word to wake embedding because it's very popular. So it turns out that defining a, a, was was it a Wasserstein distance between uh, these two distributions, which are my representation of the topics, I can have an, I can uh, define an idea on uh, how similar our two topics are, and then I'm going to use the second matrix uh, to compute the similarity between um, between documents. So the question is, um, I, am I be doing better than the classical approach? Uh, so we we can discuss about that in, in the poster. So thank you. I would like to present you the, our method CalorMe that stands for covariance based L0 super resolution uh, with uh, uh, super resolution microscopy with intensity estimation. Uh, it's a joint work with our collaborator uh, Enrique Goulart and my supervisor Sebastian Sob, Luca Calatroni, and Laure Blanc Ferrand. So, our goal is to design a sparsely promoting mathematical model for super resolution in fluorescent microscopy. Our uh, method would like to have the following features, improved temporal and spatial resolution, harmless excitation level, so well suited for live cell imaging, use of standard equipment like standard microscope and conventional fluorescent dyes, and also intensity estimation. The idea is to acquire a few high density frames as the one we I have in the top uh, right part, and use a reconstruction algorithm that codifies the assumption of the temporal and spatial independence between emitters, as well as the sparse distribution of the fluorescent molecules. Um, the sparsity is enforced on the temporal covariance matrix, uh, differently from state-of-the-art uh, sparsity promoting approaches in image uh, domain. And uh, in this uh, covariance, uh, temporal covariance matrix, we can also exploit the temporal and spatial independence. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, our uh, reconstruction algorithm has two steps. The first is called support estimation. Uh, in this step, we precisely localize the fluorescent molecule in the fine grid. To do so, we are solving a non-convex variational problem with a sparsity constraint in the covariance domain. And we enforce sparsity using the non-convex but continuous exact L0 relaxation penalty, as Marta said before. And as soon as we have uh, estimated the support, we are going to the second step, uh, which is called intensity estimation. And there we estimate uh, smooth intensity values only on the support. And then we estimate also the background in the whole image. Uh, so after applying color me on uh, simulated and real data, we have good localization and reconstruction results. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Jakub Akaloga. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Lyon under the supervision of Per Borgna and uh, Amri Abrar. So I'm going to introduce you to multi-view canonical correlation analysis. So to do so, I will start, start by introducing canonical correlation analysis. So the goal is given n sources with uh, two view. For example, you can imagine a sources as a people and the two view as a front peak and the side peak of these people. And the goal of CCA is to find a lower dimensional representation of this two view through a linear projection. And we want to do so in order to preserve the cross information between the two views. So we do that by maximizing the correlation of the two projected vectors in the low dimensional space. And it has been shown that it can increase the clustering, uh, the clustering, the quality of clustering um, the quality, the, it can increase the quality of clustering of this data and various la machine learning tasks. So, but however, CCI remains limited because it only deal with two views and it, only, and it can only uh, catch some linear relationships. So, but this problem is important because it leads to many different extensions and some, and this extension can be characterized by some k property complexity, which decide whether or not this the method is scalable, is the cap the ability to deal with linear nonlinearity, is it able to deal with more than two view, and what we call graph awareness. Okay, so what I 
the fact is sources can rely on a graph. You can imagine like a, a, a social media, like sources are people and they rely on a graph. And this uh, taking care of this graph can improve results, but it also increases complexity. So here we propose a model which is based on an existing equivalence between original CCA and a Bayesian inference problem. And we solve this variational problem by an autoencoders, which where the, the schema illustrates this variational autoencoder. And our model is the only model which deals simultaneously with more than two, two, more than two view to be nonlinear, accounting for geometric structure, scalable, and plus it's also missing to missing view thanks to his probability natures. So thank you. <laughs> my apologize for the problem that occurred <laughs> with my connection. So I will um, I will emphasize that my aim is to is to find uh, a classifier that can discriminate between uh, bleeding and ulcer lesion, uh, and ulcer pixels and normal pixels as we can see here in the uh, figures below. Uh, next slide, please. So to do this, I tested uh, linear classifiers or linear models in uh, uh, color spaces. But I often get trivial classifiers, which are uh, classifiers with even uh, sensitivity equals zero or specificity equals zero. So to avoid these uh, trivial classifiers, we propose a new uh, sampling strategy uh, in which we focus only on the 2D color, on the contours of the 2D color histogram, here red green for uh, bleeding, and uh, CRY in the green here for detection. And these two, two, um, uh, two spaces, I tested 100 of linear models chosen randomly. And to find the best one, I used the rock curve space in which we got to measure the sensitivity. But we can see that uh, for a given annotation, we have a lot of normal pixels. So we propose a new sensitivity uh, denoted by sensitivity A that does not penalize uh, the mislabeling errors occurred in our labeling database. And we find that the best model to classify bleeding pixels is given by this formula. And uh, for ulcer detection, it's given by this formula. For more details, you are invited to see my poster on Wednesday afternoon. And thanks a lot. <laughs>